In this video, we're going to find all pairs of unequal integers m and n such that n to the power n equals n to the power m. This is a problem from part number 1960. Before we move on, don't forget to give a like, subscribe to my channel, and turn on post notifications. I'm going to divide the problem into four cases according to whether m and n are positive, negative, or zero. So the first case is that m and n are both positive. The second case is that one of them is positive while the other is negative. The third case is that both m and n are negative, while the fourth case is that either one of them is zero. So I'm going to discuss cases two to four before I go back to one, because cases two to four are actually relatively easier. So the second case says that one of them is positive while the other is negative. And Actually, which is positive or which is negative is actually not that important because they, the equation itself is symmetrical. So I'm going to focus on the case that m is negative and n is positive. Now under this subcase, I can say that n to the power n is equal to 1 over n to the power minus m. The reason I do this is that I want to make sure all the indices are positive. Because m is negative, I put it back, I moved the power of n to the denominator, and so now the index becomes minus m, which is positive. Now notice that the left hand side is an integer, so that for the right hand side it also has to be an integer, but apparently it's a fraction. So it's at the same time a fraction and an integer. Now from this we can deduce that n to the power minus m must be 1. Well it can be minus 1 as well but when it's minus 1 then it's negative but m to the power n is actually well I should say that n to the power m is that n to the power minus m must be positive because the base n is positive so it can't be minus 1 so actually it has to be 1. From this, we can say that n must be 1, because m can't be 0, right? So now when n is 1, I can put that back to the, into the equation, and we can deduce that m to the power 1 is equal to 1 to the power m. And from this, we can only tell that m equals to 1, but that's a contradiction, because m is negative. So that means... There is no solution for the second case. Now we come to the third case. So if m and n are both negative, then we take a look at the parity. We notice that we cannot have one to be, pos one to be even while the other to be odd, because then the parity of both sides will then be unequal. So they have to be both odd or both even. Now, after looking at this parity, we notice that if m and n is a solution. Then minus m and minus n is actually another pair of solution. Indeed, minus m to the power minus n. I can split that into minus one all to the power minus n times m to the power minus n, and that is actually one over m to the n. Well, on the other hand, for minus n to the power minus m, it is can be split into minus 1 to the power minus m times n to the power minus m, and that's minus 1 to the power minus m times 1 over n to the power m. Now at this point, the powers of minus 1 is actually equal because n and m takes the same parity, while m to the n and n to the m, let me highlight that in yellow, they are equal. So that means minus m minus n are also, is also another pair of solution. Now from this we can build a connection between the solution in the third case and the solution in the first case. So 
once I sort of complete the first case, I can actually limit the number of possibilities, I mean number of possible solutions in the third case. So from this we can tell that after solving case one, I can go back to this and get some more, so possibly some a few more solutions in the third case. Whereas for the fourth case, there's actually clearly no solution because when say m is zero, then zero to the power n equals n to the power zero. But the left hand side is actually exactly zero, unless n is zero, but zero to the power zero is undefined, so clearly there is no solution. So it remains to solve the first case, which is that m and n are both positive. Now for the main case, which is that m and n are positive, I can do the following, which is that from the fact that m to the power n equals n to the power m, I can say that I can take natural log on both sides and say that n times natural log of m equals m times natural log of n. So from this, I can rearrange that and say natural log of m over m equals natural log of n over n. Now from this it's very tempting to consider a function which is natural log of x over x and see whether we can actually find two values of x such that it gives the same output. So here is the graph of the function natural log of x over x. And I'm going to calculate once, give you a walkthrough on how do I determine the exact value of the maximum. Before I do that, I need to explain why I need to do this to find the maximum of this function. So I kind of labeled point A as the maximum, which is actually not not terribly accurate, but just to show the effect of how do I make use of the maximum. In the problem, I'm actually I was actually trying to find some values of x such that they give the same output. Now, given the function is like looks like this, which is continuous and smooth, we need to find values of x such that one is at the left of the maximum somewhere here, while another value should be somewhere here, at the right of the maximum point. Now because we have this maximum, which is quite close to zero, in fact, there are very few choices of the smaller value of the two numbers that I'm going to take. You can see that from the graph, it is about somewhere between two and four, like it can be it can be three, it can be smaller than three, but regardless, there are very few possibilities for the number for the smaller number. Say it can be let me use another color. Like it can be one, two, perhaps another one, which is three, I don't know. But I need to calculate the maximum. Like as in when would the maximum occur? So we need some calculus here. Now under this function f of x equals natural log of x over x, I kind of do a derivative and differentiate the function. By the quotient rule, the denominator is x squared and the numerator is x times the derivative of log x, which is 1 over x, minus natural log of x times the derivative of x, which is 1. So simplifying, I have the derivative to be 1 minus natural log of x over x squared. We can easily find out that there is a critical point when the derivative is 0, which is when 1 minus natural log of x equals 0, and that means x is equal to e, a constant that it takes value 2.718 and so on, which is not important because we know that this maximum should occur at 2.7 something. So that means the smaller number among m and n, say if I say m is more than n, then that means m can only be either 1 or 2. And then now the rest is to come 
to decide whether where when m is one or when m is two what value should n take of course we can do a few more steps to make sure that we are actually finding the maximum apart from really taking at the curve i can somehow use the first derivative test you will realize that the derivative when x is less than e will be positive while the derivative when x is larger than e will be negative instead you can try some values like say x equals 1 then the derivative would be just 1 over 1 which is positive while for this side maybe you can test say x equals e squared and you realize that the derivative is minus 1 over e squared which is negative so we can see that it increases stops and decreases as illustrated in the graph very clear very explicit that means the maximum occurs when x equals e of course the, the maximum value is actually not important what matters is when does this maximum occur so now let's get back to the equation which is that if i let m to be the small number then m is either one or two so i can go back to my first case now if m equals 1, then 1 to the power n equals n to the power 1. And from this, we can quickly say that n equals 1. But we have to reject this solution because m and n has to be unequal. So we can quickly move to the second case, which is when m is 2, then 2 to the power n equals n to the power 2. And from this, you can quickly see that n has to be a power of 2 as well, because left-hand side is also a power of 2. So I can let n to be some power of 2, say 2 to the power a, where a is non-negative and an integer. Then the equation becomes 2 to the power 2 to the power of a equals 2 to the power of a all squared. And that is actually 2 to the power 2a. So taking equating the index I can say that 2 to the power a equals 2a and hence 2 to the power a minus 1 oops I've written something wrong it should be 2 to the power a equals 2 times a not 2 to the power a as well so divide both sides by 2 I have a to be equal to 2 to the power a minus 1 that means again a is a power of 2 as well now however we can quickly notice that I don't even need to use algebra to make a graph, but I can quickly see that 2 to the power a minus 1 should look something like this. While for a function, it should be something like this. Notice that somewhere here, function 2 to the a minus 1 should grow much faster than a. So notice that for a is larger than 2, to compare the speed of the growth, the rate of the growth, I need to do a derivative again, just to make things rigorous. For a is larger than 2, the derivative of the function 2 to the a minus 1 is larger than the derivative of a. So I can say that, therefore, well actually not, not therefore so quickly, but I need to say that, and when a is 2, I have a solution actually, which is 2 to the 2 minus 1 equals 2. So therefore, no solution for a that is larger than 2 because at when a is equal to 2 it starts to grow faster and when a is 2 they are equal so they have the same starting point but starting from this point we have a faster growing rate in the function 2 to the a minus 1 so there is no more uh, no any other solution after x after a equals 2 
So it, it remains to check that whether we have a solution when a equals 1 or 0. When a equals 1 is a solution, 2 to the 1 minus 1 equals 1, take. While for a equals 0, 2 to the power 0 minus 1 does not equal to 0. So therefore, a equals 1, 2, and for respective cases, n equals 2 to the power a, which is 2, and 4. So that means m and n can be 2, 2, or 2, 4. Of course, we have to reject 2, 2, because they have to be unequal. So 2, 4 is a pair of solution. And also, of course, we must have 4, 2 by symmetry. So these are the only solutions for the positive case. That means our first case all in all. Now, finally, we can move back to the third case, which is that when they are both negative, from our results we have achieved before, we know that our remaining candidates are minus 2, minus 4, and minus 4, minus 2. It remains to check. When m and n are minus 2 and minus 4, then I have minus 2 to the power minus 4 is actually equal to 1 over 16. And same for minus 4 to the power minus 2. So we can quickly take both candidates and conclude that all our solutions are 2, 4, 4, 2, minus 2, minus 4, and finally minus 4, minus 2. These are all the solutions we have for the equation n to the n equals n to the m.